Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a program in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, anything that we feel like talking about. I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of the show. I'm Ken Michaels. You might know me for another Beatles program that I host, a syndicated show called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three other co-hosts, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, the number one Beatles news source on the internet, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we also have one of the writers, one of the main writers for Beatle Fan Magazine. He's been with them since the very beginning, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also joining us is another writer for Beatle Fan and a freelance writer and musicologist and writer of several Beatle books. And his latest book was called Got That Something? How I Want It, Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. That being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And with us on the show this time is a special guest, someone whose work I'm very familiar with because I've used it quite a lot. One of his uh, a reference book on the solo Beatles called Eight Arms to Hold You. He's one of the co-authors of that book, and he has just finished part one of a three-volume series on John Lennon's life, with Yoko, it's called Leninology, and uh, the first chapter is called Strange Days Indeed, and that is Chip Mattinger. We welcome him to Things We Said Today. Hi, Chip. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me here. It's great to have you, finally. And I've wanted to have you as a guest for quite a long time for, for Eight Arms to Hold You, and now we have another book to talk about with you. I thought I'd start the conversation by just asking the very basic question of, what was the premise behind Leninology, and what makes this book different from all the other books on John and Yoko? Well, the, the, the premise was when Eight Arms to Hold You, the, the solo book that you referenced, came out uh, this time of year, Halloween of 2000, I started taking notes for an updated edition, and I made a, a list of, you know, if I had unlimited time, all the people I'd want to interview to, to, to really beef up the book. And I never got past John. There hmm. were just so many people to talk to and you'd talk to one person and they'd suggest that you talk to two more and it, it just kept mushrooming. And then I, I realized how much Yoko contributed to his art and how much he contributed to her. And that by only telling John's side of the story, you, you were really only getting half. Uh, right. There are a lot of things that uh, a lot of things that I learned that I was surprised to find that that John had produced in the avant-garde world. So, and the second half of the question was, how is this different? Um, as you all know, there could be libraries filled with Beatle books, and there are. This book has basically been started from scratch. I, I tried to clear the plate and start with contemporary newspaper interviews and interview sources and build the timeline from that and then use interviews with contemporaries basically for color. So the main goal of the book was for it to be a, a very uh, sturdy foundation or, or timeline of John and Yoko's life together. And then we could hang every, everybody else's anecdote on this timeline. Mm -hmm. And just so everyone knows, because this is a three-volume series, where does this book start, uh, part one, and where does it end? And when can we expect the next two volumes? Well, Strange Days Indeed is uh, presented in a, a timeline form without foresight. It's, it's like a diary, and it begins with the, the night that John met Yoko at the Indica Gallery, and it proceeds and goes through December 1980. Volume one is basically the, the setting up for the latter volumes, uh, which will go into considerable depth on the, the home recordings, the films, the live performances, the happenings, the art gallery exhibitions, and most importantly, the, the recordings and the music. I hope to strike while the iron is hot and 
these books, the, the second and third volumes, I was writing all along and would hope that around this time next year, I could have volume two. But then again, I said uh, 13 years ago that Strange Days indeed would be out, and here I am 15 years into a two-year project. But it's done. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm enjoying what I'm reading so far, and we're going to go around and have each of the hosts ask you a question. So we'll start with Alan. Okay, so I guess we should clarify for the reader that since the books are sort of in the mail and on the way at this point, we've read basically the first 80 pages. And I guess we, we can, can see from that how the, what the format is, how, it, it, how it's laid out, and, um, and what kind of things are in it. Uh, when you say uh, without foresight, um, you're sort of talking about like in, in, in the same way that Mark Lewison wrote his book without, you know, the, the, the wisdom of hindsight of, uh, of knowing what eventually happened. Right. So when you you talk about, for instance, John starting to record Good Night, you say in his yet untitled lullaby for for Julie. And, and we all sort of know what it is, but you're not jumping the gun because it hasn't been titled yet. Right. That's, That's basically right. the. Yeah. Is there uh, I, I'm not sure what the um, the stuff in the back of the book is going to look like. Uh, are the footnotes sort of like, you know, by page number? Because there are so many quotes and sometimes you wonder where they're from. OK, now that we have the benefit of, of pretty much everybody has a home computer and access to the Internet, I've created a separate document that annotates and notes all of the sources for every interview quote and that is going to be available electronically on the website uh it's currently running around 180 pages mm. so it's, it's basically you know uh, may 18th uh jl what i did today and then it'll say new york times may 17th and it will allow everybody to go back and follow up on the sources if they're so inclined there will also be an electronic index of names and an electronic index of song titles. So basically, you can print these out a couple pages at a time or, or the whole thing, and you can have it side by side with the book, and you're not constantly flipping back and forth like you would be in a, a traditional book of this sort. Okay. Uh, will there be an electronic version of the full book as well? At this time, I'm concentrating all my efforts on the print version of the future editions uh, so that I can get those out. And then I will take a look into producing an electronic version, because, as you all know, uh, once one electronic copy gets out, it tends uh, to get distributed quite freely. And right. it's with the amount of work involved, I would I would rather that didn't happen. Um, okay. But uh, a searchable version is definitely beneficial. Sure. I guess, you know, one of the things that sort of struck me reading it is that you um, account for uh, John and Yoko's sort of sense of humor and and have a, a sort of wry sense of humor of your own as well. I mean, it's it's just, it was just funny reading and I, I you know ended up reading bits out loud to to my wife, Paula, as, as I was going through them, because, you know, it was sort of like on this day. Uh, this is almost certainly the day on which John declared himself to be Jesus Christ, you know, and it and it's 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 put very straightforwardly, but it's really very funny, and especially the way the whole rest of the paragraph unfolds um, was kind of amusing. Well, I I tried to make it so that it, like Eight Arms, was enjoyable to read, in addition to being used just strictly as a reference. Right. Yeah. And the Lennons were some very funny people. We, we've seen a little bit, but those of us who've had the privilege of, of hearing a, a lot of interviews and the like that not the general public hasn't seen or heard, that's even more evident. And I've tried to introduce as much as I can of that into the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it worked so far in the bits I've seen so far. Right. With uh, 1968 basically being the preview chapter, it, it's it's well-worn territory for for other uh, writers, and I think we've turned up a lot of things that are unique uh, or different facets to the story. And I should probably mention at this time that the uh, 
book was co-authored with Scott Riley. I, I started it in, in 2000 and about five years into the project, Scott came on. He's another uh, collector and historian and probably is no stranger to any of you that are on the any Beatles forums. And uh, he proved to be a, a excellent help in, in the researching and being a devil's advocate and, and walking through you know, possible timelines with me when, when into, uh, you know, there was a lot of detective work involved in this. What color socks were John wearing in this picture? And it was, it was it taken the same day as this picture. And it's a pretty rock solid reference as, as far as I'm concerned. It, we looked at it every way and tried to discredit what we'd written and we made sure that everything worked. And, uh, I'm quite happy with how it turned out. Okay, Steve? Well, Chip, let me ask a basic question, and and I know this gets debated a lot on Beatles forums, and there's a lot of differing opinions from people. And I guess the, the best way to ask the question is, you know, why does Yoko matter? What did Yoko bring to the relationship? And what was her biggest assets as far as, you know, as far as um, what she brought to John and what what she herself had? in terms of, you know, um, her artwork and her, you know, just her, just her whole, her whole thing. I mean, uh, cause she was very unique. Uh, you have to say that. I will agree. She was, she was very unique. She was a, a well-known artist in her own right, in the avant-garde circles. I, I think what she brought to, uh, the relationship was that John was able to to open himself up and express his art in different mediums. And uh, she served as a great foil for him, a great muse. And likewise, for Yoko, John served as her muse in, in many instances. And th their relationship was very tit for tat. Their albums, for example, would or the singles would come out with a John song on the A side and Yoko on the B side. Their albums would be issued in tandem as a, with the Plastic Ono Band albums. Imagine and Fly, Feeling the Space and Mind Games. They were they were truly John and Yoko, one word. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. What would you say though, as far as uh, I mean, people have, you know, for example, the Live Peace in Toronto album. When you hear that, especially for the first time, and listen to her side of that album people have been known to go what is that you know i mean what how do you explain what she did and what she was doing on her own to where uh, because i mean i've seen her perform i saw her at stanford a couple of years ago and it was an absolutely astonishing performance but i think a lot of people look at what she does and and don't really understand what she's trying to do what would you say she's uh, trying i think yoko's uh biggest biggest thing is, is total communication she wants to to be able to communicate and in, in, in all types of, of, of medium and in with the live performances fortunately we have uh, video footage or film footage of a lot of these performances where we can actually see how she's performing and uh, you'll probably agree that it, it comes off a lot better with the visuals than it does just hearing the, mm -hmm. the LP. I think she was just totally free in, in expressing her, what she was trying to express at, at that point in time. And in live piece, she was performing Don't Worry Kyoko, which, which was an older piece from late 1968 and uh, would soon come out as the B-side to the Cold Turkey single. So that was one of the tunes that she, she played that night, and it was in more of an extended version with, uh, you know, basically using her voice as its own unique instrument. You know, instead of a lengthy drum solo, we have a solo full of Yoko's vocalizations. Mm -hmm. Would you also agree that one of the one of the – elements of their relationship was the fact that she they, they both looked at each other as equals they were on equal footing it wasn't a it wasn't for i mean it was obviously it wasn't like the cynthia john relationship but they were definitely you know toe to toe definitely equal standing between the two is that what you that's, yes that 
that's exactly it. John treated Yoko as an equal. She had a very difficult time living in his shadow and, and making herself heard, and possibly that contributed to some of the uh, intensity of her performances, but was to actually to come across as something memorable. But John would treat her as, as he often used the expression that you wouldn't ask your best friend to go get you a cup of coffee or, or something like that. If I were to ask Paul that, well, he'd, he'd hit me. He were. So uh, he, he put Yoko on, on an equal footing, as you put it. Okay. Thanks, Chip. Okay. How about you, Al? Conversely, kind of to play devil's advocate, on uh, uh, flipping over from from Steve's questioning, uh, you're certainly aware that there is a you know a considerable number of your potential audience uh, who probably resent the fact that you're basically that you're that it is John John and Yoko one word you know that that you're equating the two of them. Um, how do you answer those kind of, you know, how dare you uh, put her on, uh, you know, in the, the, the status of a beetle, that sort of thing? How do you counter those, those kinds of, of uh, but I don't want to say accusations, but certainly. Um, well, that's uh, a fine word. I yeah. Mean, mm-hmm. Actually, I had a guy write today or yesterday that, you know, I'm a big fan of the other work, but how could you include Yoko on, on give her equal time in this book? That's a deal breaker. Exactly. For exactly. And uh, the way I'd have to, to answer that is I think you'll be very surprised how much you learn about John in reading about Yoko. Obviously, well, okay. our, our primary goal here is to learn as much about John and the other Beatles as much as we can, but you you can't write her out of the story. She was there for all of it Mm -hmm. and she contributed to it. And I think the readers will be pleasantly surprised how much they learn and what they learn about John and his personality and his artistic output by reading about the, the Yoko led art endeavors. Hmm. Now, for instance, uh, there you know there have been books written about John's humor, but you you indicate that actually both of them have have a great deal of a of a sense of humor and of irony. In Yoko's case, how would you explain that? Uh, y- Yoko's humor was was very dry and not often expressed in public, but it's, it's present in the, the interviews and the, the, uh, uh, the recordings that, that we all amass. Um, um, I, I think some of the most interesting examples of, of John and Yoko's uh, verbal bantering is present on a lot of the, uh, the, the hidden mic tapes from the double fantasy sessions. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of the, the dialogue that would go back and forth between them. For example, I think Yoko was, was trying to record a lead vocal to, to one of her songs and having difficulty with it. And once she finally completed it, John was John's response was, next time, write a song that you can sing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I can't because this is a, is a public broadcast here to say what her response was, but uh, I, can, I can imagine. <laughs> I think we can all imagine. Um, so, so there was a lot of that uh, present, and in the book, kind of turned into an oral history. There was so much interview material available for them that we were able to uh, tell the story in their own words. So, uh, I think uh, a lot of the the, the wisecracks and. and and examples of their humor, I, I tried to leave in to make it as entertaining as possible, to, to show that side of, of the Lennons that we don't see as an outsider. Now, in telling the story in their own words, that sometimes can be difficult in, in John's case, because a lot of times what he would say in one interview, 
he might uh, totally go the opposite uh, the opposite direction in an interview that he did six months later. I don't know that I should read the opening of the book here so that it doesn't spoil it for everybody else, but there's okay. a, a, a prime quote from John that, that kind of addresses uh, your comment. And, and would you like mm-hmm. me to go ahead with that? Please. Or? Please. John was poor uh. with dates. He spoke in generalities and frequently exaggerated. On rare occasions, a factual error will be noted by use of the Latin verb sick, and only if warranted so as not to distract from the text or dilute the purpose of the annotation. The reader can be confident that we are aware of these inaccuracies and have deliberately left them in place. In some cases, a comment will contradict what has been presented elsewhere as a fact. One might argue that they were there, but only after careful consideration and diligent research will a distinct contradiction of a direct quote appear in an entry. So, uh, John mentioned that uh, I'm not good with dates, but whatever it was, it's all documented. That's why I don't have to bother with dates, because it's all on paper in the file somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think with with Strange Days Indeed, we have managed to uh, bring many of those papers together, as many of those as, as possible, and... Uh, collate them and present them as uh, what we've subtitled a scrapbook of madness, which may be a quote familiar to many of you that have heard the Rolling Stone interview. Uh And John had uh, perceived himself in his his retirement years as being on the the coast of of Scotland or, or Cornwall, where he and Yoko could spend time going through their scrapbook of madness and waiting for postcards from Sean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, Did that answer uh, that one? Yeah, no, and then, and then you can pretty much let the audience or your, your readership pretty much draw their own conclusions. Exactly. Right. Uh, Ken? Yeah, I was wondering, I know that so much of the information that you got in the book was from um, sources of the time. Did you try to approach Yoko while while writing this book for an interview yourself, as well as so many of the other key figures in John's life, like the other Beatles, people at Apple, Cynthia Lennon? Did you get any interviews from any of those people? I don't want to drop any names. Um, Alan, was, Alan was involved in an early stage because he had had a relationship with Yoko and and we were trying to decide, should we talk to her or not? And we decided that in order to present an unbiased story, we felt that we should forsake her input Mm -hmm. and to proceed with that. We had sufficient uh, material to, to tell the story and we wanted to keep it truthful and, and unbiased, and I think we were able to achieve that. Granted, she would have been able to bring something to the table, but there may very well have been strings attached, and we wanted to avoid that. Okay. Uh, a lot of the other major people, we talked to some, uh, none of the Beatles, but I think we had a excellent cross-sampling of the two different camps, the the pro-Yoko camp and the anti-Yoko camp, and uh, presented both sides equally to, as you put it, let the reader draw their own conclusion. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was wondering about the people at Apple, because so many key figures have now passed away, like Neil Aspinall and Derek Taylor. Did you think in, in, in any way of approaching them? Did you interview uh, them at all? did not interview either, uh, either of the gentlemen. I did have access to a lot of documentation that uh, from the Apple years that uh, has not been published before. And uh, we were able to use that in, in the new book, not necessarily as in the form that it appeared, but as, uh, as a solid uh, foundation for the information that we had gathered. Mm-hmm. Okay. I want to ask you just a very... Uh, A a simple question here, which I think a lot of Beatle fans will question, and that is that it's often said that that Yoko didn't really know who the Beatles were at the time when 
when Yoko met John. Do you believe that to be the case? I mean, she was in the avant-garde world. She could have been pretty much in a vacuum, you know, not being aware of what was going on in pop music at the time. Is there anything to indicate that that wasn't the case? I don't. I came across nothing to, you know, I think Yoko's the only person that could answer that and whether or not she would answer that completely truthfully, uh, no one will know but, but Yoko. One thing I will say about a lot of the, the early time in the book, there wasn't a lot of information on it because for all intents and purposes, they were having an affair. So that's mm-hmm. clearly something that I would think that they would not publicize in any manner. So because we were so reliant on contemporary documentation, there are some holes in, in those early, early days of their relationship that only the two of them could have told anybody what happened. All right. You know, for for all that's said about how the press in particular have been unkind to Yoko for so many years, especially around the time of the Beatle breakup and, and trying to understand the relationship between John and Yoko throughout the 70s and up through John's passing, it's also been said that in particular in England, she was really treated horribly. Was she treated so much worse there than in America? And can you shed some light on that? I would have to say yes. Um, being Anglophiles, as I'm sure you, you all are, uh, you are familiar with how vicious the British press can be. Mm-hmm. And uh, she was an easy target. And uh, around the time, uh, I'd say July of 71, it had come to a breaking point. And John was so fed up with how they were being treated. He basically said, if it wasn't for this huge house I have here, being Tittner's Park, we'd be out of here. And it didn't take too much longer until they landed in New York. And and as we all know, didn't come back. Mm -hmm. Right. There are there are examples throughout the book, uh, many examples of the uh, the British press and their their reaction to Yoko and their accusations. Those have been left in because they are they're factual. I mean, mm-hmm. they were they were treated poorly. She was she was in particular, and and John loving her as much as he did, uh, of course, took it all personally. Was it more to do with the fact that she was an avant-garde artist and hard to understand? Or was it just because people couldn't understand the relationship between her and John? I think it was more so the latter, that people could not understand what John saw in Yoko. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, people fear most what they don't understand. And I, I believe that was the case. Alan? Yeah, I, you know, I think in terms of um, the, it is an interesting question that uh, that people always think of, about and, and debate about whether Yoko knew who the Beatles were or or not. Um, uh, but you have in one section of the book, it's either Anthony Fawcett or Pete Shotton is sent off with Yoko to explain to her the sort of roadmap of Beatles world and who's who and all that. And you would think that if she knew that much about it, she wouldn't really need to be told a lot of that. Um, I think, I mean, the, the little bits of evidence that come through the book about whether or not she knew who the Beatles were really sort of indicate that she may not have, you know, she may have been a little in the dark about that because she did come from a different world. That's a great um, observation. I mean, and, and that's a good example of how when we didn't know a black and white answer to a question such as, did Yoko know who John was, we would leave indications, you know, anecdotes or the like that might shed some light one way or the other and to let the reader decide then. And I think also, I mean, it, it is an interesting question as, as Al asked about, you know, why couldn't you just focus on John? But I think another thing that will come through the book is that you can't. I mean, you just can't. They they, they were John and Yoko, in effect. And you could, as a record buyer, decide to just buy the stuff that John had to himself. But if you're telling the story, it's kind of like telling the story of tying a shoe but not doing the left lace, you know. So... um <laughs> 
yeah. Uh, do, I, mean, I, I, I don't imagine there was ever a, a period while you were at the very beginning when you were starting this when you thought of it possibly as just being John. Uh, well, uh, Eight Arms to Hold You basically uh, concentrated on, on John's individual efforts. And as I mentioned, the, the, the new book started out as, as by gathering information as an update to Eight Arms. So I would have to say, yes, the, in the early stages of the book, I did consider, you know, just presenting John's escapades or, or, or activities. But then when I realized how much she was involved, I realized that you just can't tell one side of the story. It's you'll only get half of, of what he was. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it, I know that, that the the process of writing this was done at the same time as collecting information for the books about the works and how they came together. Um, I think a, a lot of people, I mean, obviously will get, this as a backdrop to the second book, but um, are really, really waiting for the second book um, because of all that information that we don't have that um, we want to read about. And um, I, I'm wondering how you sort of juggled the two the two feats because they're they're different kinds of books, but they sort of complement each other. The the book was very carefully designed in that regard, so as to provide a. a a background, a, a guidepost, as it were, to the activities and the recordings and the like. But in order to keep the the, the work consistent, uh, in some cases, we know a lot more about the recording of the Imagine album than we would about the Fly album. But in this book, in order to keep it consistent, we would just include, you know, the basic recording sessions. This day they worked on Crippled Inside. And in the future books, that'll be detailed to the nth degree. We'll have the, the the take numbers, we'll have the take box numbers, we'll have the remix numbers, and, and just about everything that you can imagine. So it, there were guideposts left there, and there was enough information, I think, in Strange Days indeed, to, uh, uh, to give the reader a lot of new information, but there's a lot to look forward to in the, in the later books. Mm-hmm. So how much information did you dig up about life with the lions? (laughs) 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 You couldn't very well not mention it on a show about John and Yoko. No, we could. It's a little running joke. (laughs) There's a, yeah, there's a, we know when they did side one and uh, of course, and, and actually it's, kind of neat that uh, side one was just an excerpt of a all afternoon concert where different musicians would wander onto the stage and contribute their part of the performance. And, and the extract that we have is Cambridge 1969 was, was just John and Yoko's contribution to that uh, natural music concert at uh, the Lady Mitchell Hall. So there's plenty about life with the lions, Alan. Mm. More than you should know. Are there outtakes? Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and not going to go to this. Yeah, there are outtakes of two minute silence. No, there there are a few, <laughs> there are some additional bits that uh, haven't been documented before. Oh my God! Now you got Alan all excited. <laughs> Well, where did you, what, what about the story, you know, the famous story of the rat? Where did you um, end up on that one? You know, do uh, people know this? The, apparently, uh, the, the reports were by people who were there, although Yoko has denied it, that um, at one point they brought in a shoebox with a dead rat in it. And they spent a lot of time discussing how to mic the dead rat. Really? Yeah. Yoko later claimed that it never happened, but um, several people who were there say that it did. So Uh, how how did you uh, navigate your way through that, Chip? I I asked a number of people if they remembered the event. Uh, Nobody would fess up. I did find uh, a possibility of where the story may have originated was when they were she was recording the the Fly album. They were considering doing some recording with another avant-garde artist, uh, Henry Flint. 
and there were some sessions produced at the same time by Al Steckler of Apple. And uh, I don't have the exact titles in front of me, but one of them was, I think, Giant Rat and Dead Spiders. <laughs> so there's, it's quite possible that the the urban legend has has grown out of the notation on a tape box. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I suppose we can um, kick this over to Al to bring it up to a more civil level at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, most people know you primarily through Eight Arms to Hold You, which uh, to put it in a, in a capsule form, basically chronicles just about every professional move that the Beatles made uh, right up to roughly 2000. Now, with that background, how would you then explain basically what is different besides the Yoko factor? What is different about this project as opposed to uh, as opposed to eight arms to hold you? And particularly in, in the case of of the you know, uh, large amount of material on John, which is in eight arms to hold you. I would see. Strange Days, indeed, as more of a history book, mm-hmm. whereas Eight Arms to Hold You is a collector's guide. Right. Uh, uh, heavily annotated collector's guide, whereas Strange Days, indeed, gives you the background, gives you the historical foundation. The future volumes of the Leninology series are going to be more of the collector's guide. Mm-hmm. In what way? Uh, they'll be similar to the presentation in Eight Arms to Hold You. There'll be a, a song by song analysis, only this in this case, with considerably more information about the uh, the sessions and the other artistic endeavors, the films. I, I think one of the most satisfying uh, parts of researching the books was working on locating the various film locations in New York City where they shot a lot of the the little uh, silent bits for the Imagine mm-hmm. film. Sure. So uh, there's a, a lot of new information on that. I was uh, particularly excited when we located where the large orange plexiglass circles were uh, that, that featured so, so much in the film and, and, and promotional photos used by Apple. Uh, that was a, a piece of information that I was – reluctant to publish the book until we found it uh without giving too much away where were they they're in new york city i want i'm not a native new yorker but i want to say lake street but they were down on the southern tip of manhattan they spent the day and 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 hit maybe a half a dozen sites down around on the, the southern tip of manhattan and i believe that's where they started that day Water Street, there it is, 77 Water Street. Yeah, Water Street mm. Plaza, as we say here in the Midwest, out on the plaza. The plaza, right? Yep. <laughs> and I believe they are still there, looking as orange as ever. Really? All these years later, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Steve? You no, know it's we all live for bits like that. That's right. That's oh, right. sure. That's right. That's right. Chip, let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. Well, let me ask you a couple of things. Uh, number one, do you have any theory on? Because we all know what they were doing the night when John was killed. Do you have any theory on where their music would have been headed um, had he not been killed? I can only speculate, of course. I think they mm-hmm. would have uh, finished off the second album, whether or not they would have used all the material that appeared on Milk and Honey or not. Uh, I think he probably would have come up with, with some more material for the second record. And I do believe that there were the wheels were starting to turn to uh, to plan a small concert tour. So I think there would have been live performances in, in the uh, spring summer of 1981. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she said. I think Yoko has actually confirmed that. In fact, I think it was. In fact, I remember writing a while back that he was actually talking about doing Beatles songs for that. Let me let me ask one other thing. A uh, uh, kind of an unrelated thing, and I don't know. 
if this is too um, sicky to get into or not, but it's always kind of been my feeling, sad to say, that a lot of the dislike of Yoko has not has been a racial thing. Do you have any theories about that? Do you agree with that? When I was writing the book, I was surprised, and I won't say shocked, but I was surprised to read a quote that John considered them to be a biracial couple, and I had never thought of them that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I can't say for certain, but I don't know that a, a lot of the negative uh, publicity or feelings toward Yoko would have stemmed from that. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily from that comment, because I don't think, because that's the first time I'd heard that. But I'm just, uh, uh, you know, I remember, for example, and this has nothing to do with anything, when Cynthia Lennon appeared at the uh, Fest for, for Beatle fans in Los Angeles and mentioned her name, there were a lot of boos. And now that may have been more for Cynthia, you know, loyalty to Cynthia than anything else. But I, I do remember that. And there was always, and there's anytime it seems like you bring up Yoko's name, there are always people that will, you know, that will have negative comments. I think I put up a, a link or something the other day and there were some, there were people, you know, complaining about it. And it's just, it's, it's strange that, you know, that, uh, I mean, her art is, as, as I, we were talking earlier, her art is, is unique. Um, and, you know, it's just, you wonder how much, you know, if people are judging it partially from that angle. I mean, you hope not, for God's sake. But you hope not. Clearly, she's undeserving of all of the the negative feelings towards her. I just think she's she's such an easy target because, mm-hmm. you know, people suggest that she broke up the Beatles and right. it, it works itself into, you know, it hits the Internet and everybody that really doesn't know the background of the, the breakup of the Beatles just latch on to that fact. And that's still and that's still prevalent. I mean, it's still you can still see it. I mean, it. You know, um, how many times have you have you seen the headline? You know, oh no, every time. You know, I mean, it gets used all the time. You know, because of her. You know, every time they they want to mention her, and it's pretty just pretty disgusting. Uh, you know, it's just, yeah. I, mean, I think John had uh, mentioned in, a, in an interview or two that he thought that it was racist early on. You did know, he? Uh, Possibly even in the the Rolling Stone interview, um, mm-hmm. he made it clear that he felt that a lot of the, especially the British press, uh, treatment of her was racist. Mm-hmm. You know, but you know, then that was that was how he felt it, and uh, wouldn't yeah. surprise me if there was yeah. some of that. I Although mean, it's funny, one of the things that Chip quotes um, in uh, from uh, from the Daily Mail, where John turns up with Yoko, and they identify her as. Bottoms girl. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But one, one of the one of the one of the char- you know the if if you go Alan. If there's a real charm about her though, it's that she has a very childlike <laughs> attitude. That's one thing that that really kind of makes her. I mean, even now, especially nowadays, if you you know you see her, you know, a video of her talking or just her, you know, some of her writing. It's it's very innocent. And it's 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 very you know it's very interesting to see that uh, that she that she is that way, and uh, I think that's personally I think that's part of the reason you know that she should be liked for that reason you know I, I know that that's not going to win over everybody but uh, I'd agree I don't know how much of it is an act. Mm-hmm. There, that's um, a good point. It, how much of it is put on to to maintain that image, but. You think her artwork is simplistic, but I think there is some complexity to it in that she has designed it so that the participant has to contribute to the piece of art to make it whole. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. That, it's a great that, point. That all of their early efforts were termed unfinished music because they wanted the listener to, to have uh, their contribution to it. And, and as I think we said in Eight Arms to Hold You, many... Listener's contribution was to turn off the turntable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, she still does that with the wish tree and the, and all that, you know, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, that's still that's still very true. Ken, you know, it just suddenly struck me that we live very much in an interactive world these days, and so much of what Yoko brought in her artwork was just that. 
So I think in, in some ways she was very much ahead of her time in that regard. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't you uh, agree, think, Chip? Yes, I would. I think in, it might have been in 1995 or 96, in the, in the early days of the Internet, she had a, a, a daily uh, piece called Acorns. Is, is that right, Alan? Does that ring a bell? Where every day she, she'd yeah. send out an email or send out an instruction that that basically goes back to one of her very early pieces, the the Do It Yourself Dance Festival, which is when she would send out a postcard with an instruction on it. And this was in the early stages of her relationship with John. And he he said in many interviews that at times he'd be elated with the instructions that she'd sent. And at other times, she'd find them terribly frustrating. And uh, <laughs> that, that's one of the things I, I do enjoy about her work is the unfinished aspect of it. Hmm. Hmm. All right. You, you sort of hinted on this earlier, but uh, could you just pinpoint, without giving too much away, just give an example of something that you learned about John and or Yoko in doing your research that you never knew before that really surprised you? Maybe one or two examples. Okay, let me think. I should have been prepared for a question like that. (laughs) Um, I think a lot of the things where we were able to conclusively pinpoint when certain events happened, such as Mm. we can say conclusively the night that they did meet, we can say conclusively the night that they uh, created two virgins at Kenwood, which is considerably different date than has been widely accepted in the past. Uh, So there's a lot of new information in that regard. Uh, Something I learned about them. Wow. There's just so much that is, is new in the book. Is there a Uh, song or a project that you discover that maybe has never been reported before? For you here. I got, we uh, were able to, uh, it's long been rumored that the plastic Ono band recorded an instrumental called rock piece uh, many might have heard about that but it, and uh due to a mention in, in a uh, in the beatles book and we were able to determine the recording date and recording personnel for the piece and have also found a recording a copy of the rock piece recording Hmm. And I think when we do reveal that, people will be very, very surprised. Well, so is it okay. discussed in, in this volume? Nope. I, I oh. give the recording date and the people, but I don't tell where you can find it. Oh, okay. you got to got to keep something to keep you reading the next one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but there, there, are a and, lot of, there are a lot of little uh, things like that throughout that are, you know, little little markers to something that's going to be coming in the future for a little setup to to a topic that's going to be uh, covered in, in more detail. And like I said, a lot of that was to maintain consistency through the new book, since we know a lot more about it, Imagine than we do about life with the lions. <laughs> One thing we were unable to uh, determine conclusively were the uh, the recordings that were the 78 recordings that they incorporated on the two virgins album. Uh, we, we feel that it was a record out of John's collection, but we've been unable to, uh, to find the actual recording. Is there any information on the songs that John wrote in the late seventies that were supposed to be used for, for a musical called the ballad of John and Yoko? Since this book is so uh, date sensitive, as it were, so so timeline based, a, a lot of John's private recordings weren't documented in that regard. Uh, so what I've done here is included a, a list. I think it's a three or four page list of unreleased song titles that were recorded during that house husband period. Right. And. I'll go into the 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 stage musical uh, aspects in in one of the future books. Okay. Well, we're just about out of time, but I do want to ask you this one very important question. Since I'm a major fan of Eight Arms to Hold You, as are all of us, are there any plans that you would ever update and include all the other solo works from the other Beatles up to the present time? 
Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think I could ever listen to all those McCartney or Ringo shows over again? <laughs> oh, I, I would. Uh, I don't think they're in, that. That's uh, that's going to be possible just because of the. I, I think Ringo's passed 750 live shows now with the All Star Band, mm-hmm. something like that. But you have and, all the. Uh, you have all the studio albums to go through. Uh, we have uh, have a lot of new George information. I have a lot of new Ringo information, a lot of Paul information. Um, but there's still some some big gaps that uh, would make the book very lopsided or inconsistent. You know, you could have a, a lot of information about. Uh, for example, the recording of All Things Must Pass and the mixing of the album, but absolutely nothing about the George Harrison album except a two or three month period when the songs were done, just because that information is that album was recorded at home and the the information hasn't made it into the public eye because there haven't been members of the public involved in the production. So that's one reason I'd be reluctant to uh produce a, a, an updated version of eight arms i could possibly see uh maybe an updated version that covers the same period up through 2000 which would be a case of something's better than nothing i suppose and there would be just reams of new information that could be included in that but it's it's finding a good vehicle for it i was just going to say the answer that at this point, with uh, what I've gone through in the, in the last few months and then completing uh, and getting Strange Days and D printed, is uh, I don't want to work on any Beatle books for a little bit. Mm. <laughs> that might change by next week, but uh, I think I'm going to take the rest of the week off. Well, you've earned it there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, it's 15 years in the making. I don't know where the time's gone. But uh, I often thought that one morning I'd wake up and it would just be done. And it almost came to that, you know, just kept filling in the gaps and and finding more and more pieces. And eventually it was all there and just needed to be strung together. Mm -hmm. Now, this first Uh, volume is also a a limited edition, correct? There's only a limited number of copies. Right now, the... uh, there is a limited number of hardback copies. There were 500 hardback copies produced. Uh, the first 250 were numbered and signed by Scott and myself. And then the first run of the paperback edition was uh, around 1,500 copies. Okay. So they are uh, just starting to ship out now. People uh, are receiving the first copies today. So I'm kind of anxious to see what, what the reaction is after, after all this time. And the, the, the books are selling well without anybody of having read a single page yet. All right. So do you guys have any last questions for Chip? Um, how, does, how do people get it? I, think, I don't think, do we actually ask that? I don't think we Yeah, can. give your website. Yes. No, that's a good, good thing to mention here. I'd forgotten all about it. Uh, the book is available exclusively at the website www.leninology.com. You will not find it on Amazon. You will not find it in your local bookstore. So if you want a copy, that's where you need to go. Okay. Anybody else? Nope. All right. So if you would like to get in touch with us, we have an email address here for the show, which is things we All said right. today. Radio show at gmail.com. We also have our own Facebook page and we have our own Twitter account. What's the uh, address there, Steve? It's Things We Said Fab. Right. And uh, if you want to get in touch with me, Ken Michaels, you can do so at my email address, which is every little thing at att.net. And be sure to check out my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Al, if people want to get in touch with you, they can do so how? Uh, basically through either through Facebook or Beetlefan, uh, www.beetlefan.com or uh, Facebook at Al Sussman or on Twitter at A-S-U-S-S-4-9. Uh, and also, I guess, through Parading Press as well. 
All right. How about you, Alan? Oh, probably the easiest way to get in touch with me is through Facebook, um, either under Alan Cozen or my alter ego, Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, or you could email me at alancozen at gmail.com. Steve, how about you? Uh, people can get in touch with me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I also have uh, my own Facebook page, and there's a Beatles news group where I post things all the time, uh, Beatles news and commentary that you're welcome to join. Okay. And Chip, it's been great having you here. We'd love to have you on again. Keep us posted when the next volume will come out, and good luck with uh, the first volume. Thanks again, guys. All right. So for Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, Alan Cozen, and Chip Manninger, I'm Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>